Greetings and welcome to In-Depth. I'm DK Rasta. As you can see from the view, we have literally journeyed up the mount. We're here to speak with Abbot John Pereira about the history and initiatives of Mount St. Benedict. So, Abbot Pereira, we want to thank you for making the time. We are here, it feels like the upper room, we're on, Mount, on the Mount St. Benedict. Mm -hmm. But looking at just that name that so many people in Trinidad and Tobago have become, well, they've come to associate with things. Let's start from the ground up, thank you. Who is St. Benedict? We do have a statue here of St. Benedict. He was born in the year 480 in Italy, in a place called Nosha. He was born as a twin. His sister's name was Scholastica. And they were very close to each other. As a young man, because of his aptitude, he was sent to Rome to further his education, to study law. And as a student, he became disillusioned with the materialism and the hedonism that he met in the city. And uh, he felt that maybe there was more in life than having sex, running down women, making money. And he decided to take an exit. He left school, he left home. And he went to live in a very lonely place called Subiaco in a cave, where he lived for three years, pondering on the scriptures and the ultimate meaning of human existence. And uh, while there, some of the students that he left behind decided to follow him into the lonely place. And he set them up into small groups. And he taught them the way of love, the way of the scriptures, what he had discovered. And uh, eventually, because of some attacks that were being hurled against him by some other priests, he left Subiaco and he founded a monastery on the top of Casino. It's called Monte Casino. And it was in Monte Casino that he wrote his rule, his rule for monks. Because he was living in Rome, Latin was the language he wrote in Latin. And that rule has been translated in several languages. It has come down to us here at Mount St. Benedict in Trinidad. And we follow that rule which outlines a way of life, of prayer, of community, of love. That's interesting. You talk about Subiaco, you talk about Monte Cassino. It seems as though there's this love for places that aren't necessarily the most accessible from the onset. But there, we, there's a Calypso, the Bahia girl. Take us to the point of the Bahia monks before we reach to Mount St. Benedict. Thanks. Well, there is a tradition in the Benedictine world that when you're going to set up a monastery, you look for a lonely place, particularly you look for a place on a hill. And uh, the oldest Benedictine community outside of Europe was founded by the Portuguese monks in Brazil, in Bahia, in the year 1581. And uh, Around the year 1900, 1909, 1910, there was a threat of religious persecution by an anti-clerical government who had targeted religious communities to destroy them or to seize them in the interest of progress. And the monastery, that ancient monastery in Bahia, was under attack. The abbot of the monastery was Dom Mayel de Caini at the time, and he wrote to the Archbishop of Port of Spain, Archbishop John Pius Dowling, asking the question whether the monks in Bahia would be welcomed to set up a community in Trinidad because they were under the threat of religious persecution. The Archbishop answered very warmly and from that moment the abbot took a decision to visit Trinidad. He saw Trinidad as a place of political stability being under British rule 
and with a large population that were probably not exposed to the Christian faith, thinking more of the East Indian community, many of them would have been Hindus, and he felt that this was a good place to begin his monastery. So he came to Trinidad and he searched many places. Some people offered him a place in El Takuch to set up a community. Eventually, one morning, he was celebrating Holy Mass at the first capital in Trinidad, which is St. Joseph, formerly called San Jose. And while he was there, he celebrated Mass. And immediately after Mass, while he was unvesting in the sacristy, an elderly gentleman by the name of Mr. Victorino Gomez came to him and said, Sir, I understand that you are looking for land to build a property. I am the owner of a piece of land, or I oversee a piece of land in the hills of Tunapuna. Would you like to have a look at it? The abbot said, sure. I am looking for land. I want to set up a community to prepare for the coming of my monks. And some people may say that the rest is history, but we continue with that story when we return from this break. Stay with us. Welcome back where we are at Mount St. Benedict speaking with Abbot John Pereira. You'll be hearing some birds in the background adding ambience, but you were giving us the history of the space here, Mount St. Benedict Abbot, and you were at the point where Mr. Gomez made uh, an overture and was offering the possibility of this piece of land that he had in Tunapuna. So please continue. So they set off on their donkey from the foot of the hill and uh, as they were coming up the hill from where is Scotiabank now at the bottom there suddenly the donkey tripped on a puddle of water the abbot in all his abbatial clothes fell into the water and dirtied his gown so Mr. Gomez apologized and asked him whether he would he said no sir a bad beginning makes a good end let us continue and they continued up the hill and as he came up to this point he was enchanted by the beauty of the place but that did not yet convince him fully that this was the spot they continued further into the hills until suddenly he saw a stream of crystal clear water and that was the turning point he said, this is where I am going to build my monastery. The reason for that is because he had been in charge of a monastery in a place called Chiara in Santa Cruz in Brazil. And each year, the monks were without water for six months because it was a very dry place. And the monks had to go and to looking for water for six months of the year. And as he came to Trinidad, he said he would not want to have a repeat performance. He does not want to make the same mistake. So when he saw water flowing through the hills, he said, this is the spot. And immediately he made arrangements with Gomez to buy the property. And from since that time until today, the monks, the pilgrims, and certain adjoining institutions, including some family homes, have been using that water to nourish themselves. And thank you so much for that. And originally, when you spoke about that crystal clear stream, I thought it was a spiritual connotation, not knowing that it was, it, it, it may have been that, but it was also very practical and functional. Correct. But you speak about pilgrims, and one of the things I think is common at Mount St. Benedict is that you have people of different religious journeys coming to Mount St. Benedict. It may be to pray, it may be to get a vehicle blessed, but speak a little bit to the inclusivity of the space tanks. Well, from the first day that the monks came here, they started to work the land. They saw these monks building the road with their pickaxe. And this was a sort of novelty. And so people were curious. 
and hundreds of people started to walk up the hills, because in those days you didn't have such a nice road as we have now. And they came to speak to the monks who always opened their ears and the air of their hearts to what they had to say. And as they did so, maybe a pilgrim might leave a dozen eggs, another might leave a few head of lettuce. And from the day one, the pilgrims have continued to come here to Mount St. Benedict. There are reports and chronicles of huge pilgrimages of East Indians. Remember, Mount St. Benedict was founded in 1912. And it was only in 1917 that indentureship. So that um, eventually the abbot appointed one of the monks to learn Hindi so that he can speak to the pilgrims, many of whom were Hindus and Muslims, in their native tongue. Other than that, there have been spiritual Baptists, Pentecostals, Anglicans, Seventh-day Adventists, people of all faiths. Some people do not see this place as a Catholic institution, but rather as a place of prayer where God can be sought and found. And it feels kind of like what people, uh, the kind of idea and energy you have when people talk about an ashram, as opposed to saying, okay, well, it is this specifically, it is welcoming and the, and, and God, uh, the God of someone's understanding yes. is, is paid respect to him. So suppose people coming from slavery, from indentureship, would have had their sacred spaces where they came from, in Africa, in India. So when they came, when this was being set up, they saw this place as a place where they could find the God of their ancestors. And from that moment... Now you speak of Mount St. Benedict, and that is the name that people know this place as. But because of the history of exile and refugees, when the monks arrived here, they dedicated this piece of land to our Blessed Mother, the Virgin Mary, under the title of Our Lady of Exile. Because as a young boy, Jesus was under the threat by Herod. He wanted to do away with all the boys under the age of two. So the monks who were fleeing from persecution, when they came here, they remember that story from the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, they dedicated this place to Our Lady of Exile. So when we think of Mary here, we do not think of her in her exalted state, but rather as a woman who was a refugee, who lived outside her home, who lived in a strange land with a different culture, a different language, different cuisine. And so many people here identify with that and they feel in the Virgin they have someone who could identify because you can be in your home but you can be living as an exile, you can't even talk to your husband or your family. Now it's more practical because there are thousands of people coming from Venezuela living as refugees and they can easily identify with this story because we are called the Monastery of Our Lady of Exile. Thank you so much for that. I would have, I would have never known. But there's so many things in terms of not being afraid to work with your hands uh, using those pickaxes. And then that brings me even uh, a little closer thinking about, because one of the things I think about the space is yogurt as well. So what are some of those activities? Because there's schools, there's a history of education. So what are some of the activities that take place? Well, one of the mottos that we apply to the Benedictine way of life is ora et labora, two Latin words, pray and work. And we have always sought to involve ourselves in work that would first be a means of sustaining ourselves, and secondly, as a means of helping many people who come to the monk, seeking some sort of financial or physical support. So we do a little garden cropping, vegetables, we prepare yogurt, we have a gift shop, we, you know, we look, as you said, education has always been, quite a, for a long time, has been part of our history. Um, woodwork, one of our brothers runs a woodwork center where we work with our hands, you know. And some of the crosses that you see in the bookshop, if you visit there, are crosses that were actually made in our workshop here, you know. So, 
in keeping with Saint Benedict who has a very exalted understanding of work not so much as a drudgery but a way of expressing your humanity we have always looked for ways you know even where we are sitting here it is part of what you call the Mount Television Network Studio we have plans eventually to be your competitor and to set up a television network called MTVN at the moment we have no funding to go beyond but we are doing what we can as far as possible we try to live stream our masses and prayer services on Facebook and YouTube but we have not yet established ourselves as a full network but anything in terms of work we are open to all right so in the three minutes that we have remaining what are some of the ways that people interact with the Abbey with the individuals here uh, how often are their services when do people come what are some of the things that they do you speak you spoke about the gift shop uh, you spoke about the workshop what are some of those other things we do have a, a parlor ministry the word parlor comes from a, another word meaning parley to talk it's a place where people feel free that they can come and express themselves and from nine o'clock in the morning until about five in the evening there is always a brother or a priest assigned to that ministry and people come at all hours of the day we call that our parlor ministry some people might refer to it as a, as a counseling ministry but we are men of god we are not qualified psychologists or psychiatrists or counselors but we have learned a way of life we love the gospels and when people come here we try to impart our knowledge to them and we pray with them so that is one activity another activity is retreats very often you have groups coming to ask for a day retreat so we might lead them in a reflection you know we do have the pilgrim center available we have the retreat house available it has been closed for three years because of the restrictions imposed by the government to stem the tide of covid and we are now trying to see how we can reopen it but we need some funding for that because it it's in a state of disrepair in some areas and so we are looking to get finance to help us establish once more or to re-establish that ministry where we impart the spirituality and the way of life of saint benedict and that sense of peace so that persons who are living ordinary lives working in the world can come apart for a weekend for a few days in order to re-energize themselves and to go back filled with the peace of saint benedict and uh, the word peace in latin is pax and that is our essential motto pax and anyone who comes to mount saint benedict must go away with a little taste of pax about john Pereira, we want to thank you so much for spending the time and because you know sometimes you know something is there but you don't necessarily know the history behind it so we want to thank you for that and we want to thank you for tuning in on behalf of the entire TGT News team. This has been In Depth with me, DK Rosta. Thank you so much for joining us.